Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us. My name is Abby Goodrum and I'm head of the UX design program at Wilfrid Laurier University. This is the second nationwide design for change challenge that Laurier's UX program has hosted. Um, and we couldn't have done that without the generous support from Scotiabank. We also could not have done this without the incredible team at Hackworks managing all of the logistics for us. So a big shout out to all of the great people there. More importantly, uh, we couldn't have done any of this without all of the incredibly talented and dedicated students from across Canada who've participated in this challenge. I'm so thrilled to have you all here, and I'm even more excited to see the solutions that you've developed over the past few weeks. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that this land on which Wilfrid Laurier operates its campuses is located on the Haldeman track. That's the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. This land is part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, and it symbolizes their agreement to share, to protect resources, and not to engage in conflict. From the Haldeman Treaty of 1784, this tree, uh, territory is described as six miles deep from each side of the Grand River, beginning at Lake Erie and extending to the head of the river, which they and their posterity are to enjoy forever. The treaty was signed by the British with their allies, the Six Nations, after the American Revolution. Despite being the largest reserve demographically in Canada, those nations now reside on less than 5% of this original territory after losing much of it to the settlement of newcomers. Please keep this legacy in mind as we listen to the presentations being made tonight. Before we start, we have a pre recorded message from Dr. Deborah McClatchy. She's the president and vice chancellor of Wilfrid Laurier University. During her time at Laurier, she's championed equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives, including the growth of support for Indigenous students, an enhanced focus on women in science, and the creation of a community of practice model to advance and distribute um, EDI initiatives throughout the university. She's also a professor of biology whose research contributes to our understanding and ability to protect the environment. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending the Design for Change Awards Ceremony. I'm sorry that I could not be with you in real time to celebrate. First off, I want to congratulate all the students from across Canada who, over the last four weeks, have been engaging in design activities to turn care and compassion into tangible solutions for people experiencing homelessness. In total, 400 students on 85 teams from 33 schools across seven provinces participated in this challenge. That's just amazing. You've taken the knowledge and skills you've gained in classes and coursework and research and your own life experiences and have applied them to finding solutions for one of the most pressing challenges we currently face in Canada. I'm extremely impressed by the creativity and quality of the submissions. You should all be so proud of your efforts. To our soon to be named winners, congratulations on the significant recognition in a national competition. To stand out in such a remarkable group is truly an accomplishment. It's my hope that you now move forward with implementing your ideas to make our world a better place. I also would like to thank all the people and organizations that brought this competition to life. Design for Change would not have been possible without the generosity of Scotiabank. Thank you so much to all the great folks at Scotiabank for everything you've done to support this endeavor. We at Laurier are incredibly grateful for your sponsorship and support. 
which provides our students and students across Canada the opportunity to engage in innovative events such as this and to sharpen their skills for future design challenges. There are also a number of people, including Laurier faculty, who have shared generously of their time and expertise to organize this event, mentor students, and act as judges. Over 60 volunteers in total have made this event possible. Thank you. I would like to personally thank Dr. Abby Goodrum for having the original vision of what a user experience design program and national competition could mean for our students and for our university. Thank you all for making this such a meaningful learning opportunity for the students. I hope that these last four weeks have inspired all the participants to look at challenges in new ways and have given you hope that together we can build a future without homelessness. Thank you once again for participating in Design for Change and I wish you all success in your future design challenges. Good evening. Wow, that was that was great. I'm so uh, I'm so uh, I'm, I'm pleased. Thank you, Deb. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is the second Design for Change challenge that Laurier's UX program has hosted. The first one focused on designing solutions to combat uh, climate change, but this challenge brought together hundreds and hundreds of students from across Canada who were interested in responding to homelessness and making a difference in their communities. Our goal initially was just to create a space to help students get together and share and collaborate and increase empathy while creating meaningful solutions that can make our future better. Um, we presented students with a particular challenge of responding to homelessness through human centered design, using care and compassion to create tangible solutions for people experiencing homelessness. Thanks to Scotiabank. The top teams tonight will be competing for some pretty amazing grand prizes. The first place team will take home $3,000 per team member. Second place will receive $2,000 per team member. And third place will win $1,000 per team member. And we are working with partners across Canada right now to find ways to implement these award-winning solutions into their communities. We are also going to have a special audience choice award of $100 per team member. This is where you, the participants, have the power and the opportunity to select your favorite team. And at the end of the top five team presentations uh, this evening or today, wherever you are, you'll get to vote on who your favorite team was. So please make sure to remember their team name um, and we'll open a poll at the end uh, to reveal that winner. I'm now going to quickly walk us through some important information so you feel extra prepared for the upcoming final judging session. So for each team, we'll first watch their pre-recorded five-minute pitch video submission. Then we'll have three minutes for a live Q&A with our judges. And then at the end of um, all, um, all of the presentations, the judges uh, will go away to a break room uh, and we'll do a deliberation to determine the top three teams while we're in the break room that's when you'll have your opportunity uh, to vote for um, the um, audience um, uh, choice award so let me let me start by introducing our fi uh, final judges who will re be responsible for judging the top five solutions to determine first second and third place winners uh, let me start with Pamela Hilborn. Pamela is currently the Senior Vice President, uh, Global Head of Design and Digital Product at Scotiabank. She's charged with implementing proven practices in strategic foresight, product strategy, and user experience design to create transformative digital financial experiences for so uh, Scotiabank customers. Pamela's career spans over 20 years in the design and product management um, of dis digital consumer hardware and software products. This expertise, along with her profound and deep interest in human behavior and culture, has allowed her to create user-friendly and engaging technology experience, 
experiences that are enjoyed by millions of people across the globe. I have to also say um, uh, that Pamela is also, um, uh, uh, she spearheaded um, a number of um, communities of practice at Scotiabank and within the UX community in Toronto around um, ethics um, and, um, uh, and, and ethical UX design. Debbie McGraw, uh, our next judge, has worked tirelessly since 1995 on eliminating poverty in Saskatchewan, as well as in Canada overall. She spent many years as an advocate, activist, and researcher on social issues such as housing, homelessness, women's issues, and poverty, including eight years on the Canada Without Poverty Board. Debbie's a steering committee member for the National Rights to Housing Network and also co-founder and co-chair of the Canadian Lived Experience Leadership Network. When the National Housing Strategy was announced, Debbie started working with colleagues across Canada to ensure that this strategy was human rights based, and Debbie continues to remain a part of this work. After 20 years of raising her children, Debbie enrolled in a university, graduating in 1998 with both her certificate and bachelor degree in Indian social work. Over the last 10 years, Debbie worked for the Salvation Army in both their women's and men's shelter shelters, as well as at the Lighthouse Supported Living as a case manager in the Housing First program. When that was shut down, Debbie was hired by Sk Saskatoon Initiative Partnership, where she built and developed a housing program fo focused on housing the homeless. Debbie's strength for this work came from her own lived experiences. There is no better motivation than frustration and anger. And Debbie learned how to channel her experience, her frustrations, her anger, and her knowledge, and turn them into powerful, positive tools for social change. Debbie is also the proud mom of five, five grown children, and she's grandma to 20, ranging in ages from 3 to 25, and she has three great-grandchildren. Our other uh, judge tonight is Wally Check. He's the director of training for the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness uh, training and, and technical assistance program. Wally is a leading national authority on housing first and other best practices that are associated with the direct services and supporting those experiencing homelessness. Wally has developed curriculum, designed programs, and provided training presentations across Canada and internationally on a variety of topics. Wally has been with the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness since 2015, and before that, he was the Housing First Specialist with the City of Lethbridge in, Al in Alberta. I am also one of the judges tonight. Um, as you know, my name is Abby Goodrum. I'm Professor and Program Coordinator for User Experience Design at Wilfrid Laurier. I teach courses in user-centered design, information architecture, and UX research methods. Before this, I was the Vice President for Research at Wilfrid Laurier. Um, I've also held the Rogers Research Chair in New Media and Technology at Toronto Metropolitan University, where I was also Associate Dean for Research in the Faculty of Communication and Design. So please welcome uh, and give, uh, give all of our judges a virtual round of applause. I am so grateful. Uh, for our judges who are giving us their time and expertise um, to be part of, of changing the landscape around homelessness and uh, supporting uh, the work of such extraordinary students. So we'll now get started with the pitches. Um, they're going to go in the following order. We're going to start with Game Changers and then move to It Starts With Hair, then Ocasio or Ocasio, uh, then Enough Scene, and then we'll end with 40 Chances. So I'm going to start now to introduce um, uh, our first team, uh, which is uh, Game Changers. Good luck, team. Today, we will be introducing Heels on Wheels, a mobile healthcare designed for homeless women. Homeless communities face many barriers when attempting to access healthcare support, including high rates of lost or stolen ID, preventing homeless individuals from creating health cards, and limiting their use of OHIP insurance. Discrimination is also a big obstacle as homeless individuals often feel judged by healthcare staff therefore making it less likely they'll seek out healthcare services. Survey conducted by Homeless Hub found that approximately 34% of the homeless population in Toronto consists of women. Existing research shows that women can become more vulnerable to poverty or homelessness due to conditions of domestic abuse as well as a lack of job security. The problem we are trying to solve is the lack of accessibility homeless women in Toronto face when trying to obtain appropriate healthcare services and support for their health needs. 
Although homeless men also face challenges obtaining health care assistance, homeless women are a more vulnerable population as their respective sexual and reproductive health can potentially lead to additional risks of health complications. This is an important concern as lack of prenatal care for homeless women leads to increased risk of negative birth complications. Homeless women often offer unhygienic methods to cope with menstruation instead of receiving sanitary products. This results in a higher prevalence of UTIs. Lastly, it's more difficult for these women to procure medication. Therefore, they must deal with heavy menstrual cramping, which can negatively impact their mental health. While our secondary research will try to learn about existing services, healthcare programs, and discover potential urgent needs of homeless women to get familiar with uncovered healthcare issues. According to Statistics Canada, there is an increasing trend of unsheltered women homelessness. Additionally, we found that three quarters of the homeless suffer from at least one chronic illness, which emphasizes that it is essential to address healthcare needs and make sure that the homeless population's ability to access a stable source of primary healthcare. We did not contact homeless women directly for primary research because we recognized they are vulnerable. Instead, we reached out to seven different organizations, conducted three interviews, and got a chance to communicate with six staff, including executive directors, to understand better the exact pain points and challenges faced by healthcare supporters and unhoused women. The identified opportunities for change are need for access and awareness, which encompass homeless women's logistical barriers, financial barriers, and lack of knowledge regarding existing services. This can be due to a lack of trust and stigma towards medical practitioners from negative past experiences. Next is the need for continuity. Through our research, we identified that homeless women need continuity with their physicians to avoid repeating their medical state and to avoid building trust all over again. In addition, Toronto is a diverse city that is home to many immigrants and refugees from varying cultural backgrounds, which poses language and religious barriers that we identified as opportunities to tackle. Another significant consideration for our solution is the need for privacy and safety for both the medical staff and homeless women. We also uncovered several areas in the GTA that have a higher population of homeless people. Several of these areas lack stable healthcare services tailored to homeless women. We found an estimated 30% of homeless people living outdoors reside in Scarborough. Thus, our focus will operate in Scarborough. We summarize our key findings and takeaways into the story of Khadija. Khadija is a 33-year-old female. She's from South Asia, Islamic culture, and she just been to Canada for a couple months. English is her second language. She lived in the tent community on the street of Scarborough, Ontario, as she is waiting to be arranged into a refugee home. She has noticed that her menstrual cycle has suddenly stopped, and she feels unfamiliar pain in her stomach area. She wanted to have a check, but she got tired to going to the emergency room for help, as she had negative experiences of being cultural stigma, language barrier, and being ignored. So how can we solve cottages problems? Based on our research and analysis, we arrived at the following solution, a mobile women's health clinic. We propose to set up a traveling team of healthcare professionals who will go to homeless communities to provide targeted healthcare services for women. After doing research into other organizations that address women's health, we discovered the following important services, preventative healthcare like pap smears and cervical screening, reproductive health services such as birth control, STI testing and treatment, ultrasounds for pregnant women, wound care, and consultations, both in person and virtually with nearby specialists. We will also be providing materials for DIY kits that the homeless women can keep with them. Our research helped us arrive at the following categories of items, feminine hygiene, personal hygiene, first aid, and sexual health. How will this solution help solve the problems of Katisha and other homeless women in Scarborough? First of all, we will be bringing the healthcare services to her, reducing the need for her to find transportation. And as we will travel around Scarborough, she will still have access to her services if she needs to move encampments as well. Education and information will be essential parts of our service in making sure that Katisha is more aware of the community supports available to her and how to care for her health while living unhoused. Khadija will not need to worry about a lack of money or OHEP, as our services and materials will be completely free for her. She will also have access to consistent care, and will be able to see the same staff each week if she remains in the same place. We will also use a medical record system like Oscar to keep track of Khadija's visits. Our research suggests that women feel more comfortable with female health care providers and find them to be more empathetic. Therefore, we will look into hiring a women-only staff. Our staff will also be trained in compassionate care, so they will understand the struggles that homeless women like Khadija face and will not show any judgment or discrimination. Similarly, we will make sure that Khadija's cultural and religious identities are respected as we help her. We will partner with translation organizations to avoid language barriers. Thus, the help and the self-serve setup of our kit station will provide Khadija with autonomy to choose which menstruation or contraceptive materials she's comfortable in using. Khadija will also be able to choose between receiving private care privately within the RV or out in the open where her community can see her. Finally, we know from research that community partnerships will be essential in arranging funding, specialists, mental health support, and more. With our plan, we aim to make the healthcare network stronger in Scarborough and support the unique needs of homeless women. Thank you. Today we will be... Sorry, as I shift gears here. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. This team was um, was very uh, in that was incredible. So you're going to get a moment to uh, to uh, to um, uh, have some questions now. So we're going to open it up to the judges. Um, judges, we have three minutes for your questions. So I think if you'll just uh, go ahead and jump in, that would be fine. So. I have just one question. 
to begin with. Um, and that is, is you know, I, first of all, thanks for the presentation. I think it's, uh, you know, it's some, it's a, it's a great idea and concept. The question I have is, based on the presentation, that's that's a, a method or an avenue to address the needs that someone has while they're experiencing homelessness. What my question is is, what would be incorporated into that to help end? the experience of homelessness that uh, that those women are facing. Hello, Wally, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much for your question. That is a really great question. Uh, something that we came across when we were doing our research with um, uh, communities or organizations that help homeless women uh, and homeless people in general is they noted that um, healthcare is one of the really main focuses that uh, homeless people have in terms of it's kind of like a basic need that they need to figure out before they can figure out um, things like mental health support and housing and things like that. Um, so we wanted to address that, um, as you mentioned as well, to address the struggles that they have during their homelessness. Um, but we also recognize from the organizations that we communicated with that partnerships are essential. Um, so that meant partnering with like housing communities, women's shelters, um, things like that. So I think that that would be an amazing next step for us would be to look into what other services we could partner with and include perhaps uh, with our team that goes out into these communities. Thank you. I also have a question. Go ahead. Watching the presentation and being that I'm from Toronto, I know how big Toronto is. Um, so how would this work to be spread out across the whole of Toronto and, and the, like Scarborough, Whitby, those areas too? Like, is there a thought for like one mobile unit or more than one mobile unit to because in one week you're still not going to cover the whole of Toronto. So what thoughts have gone into that? Maybe I'm jumping ahead. I don't know, but I had to ask. Yeah, for the Scarborough, uh, Scarborough is a, a place that kind of lack up this kind of um a uh, health care service. So we want to start on the uh, Scarborough because it's lack of the coverage. And uh, uh, we want to have uh, um, to build multiple point of the vehicle um, to provide the help. Like we want to deliver the service like we go to them instead of like them to searching the um, service. So we start from Scarborough with multiple points. So we are trying to um, enhance the healthcare networking start from there. And uh, um, we also do the um, uh, get uh, the the partnership with others, for example, um, the sistering or uh, share for homes. Um, and we also provide the mental health um, service to the people who need. Um, so I think the Scarborough is just a start point and we want to expand uh, even more large scale. Um, to the GTA or even uh, out of the province as well. Thank you. Thanks. We uh, we are out of time for Q&A for this. Um, so I'm going to thank this team very much. I hope you can hear applause. Um, you now get a chance to take a little bit of rest and you can attend the rest of the event while we get ready for our next presentation. Uh, it starts with hair. In a report conducted by Project Homeless Connect, PHC, the number of people experiencing homelessness that wish to connect with resources for personal hygiene increased from 4 to 199 from 2015 to 2017. They found that there was a 413% increase in the demand for hair care services. Shocked by these statistics, we believed we had uncovered a key niche to tackle. To find out more, we have spoke to people with lived experience of homelessness. To our surprise, the statistics we found were only part of the story. Our interviewee shared their story of their first night at our shelter. As they settled into their bed, they couldn't shake off the feeling of unease. They didn't trust anyone there and fought all urges to fall asleep. 
It was clear that at the core of the problem was something much more profound, a lack of trust. We learned from our interviewee how years of trauma, abuse, and neglect caused many individuals experiencing homelessness to become wary of others and hesitant to reach out for help. As technology-minded youths, we scrambled to think of a tech solution, but it was another interviewee who reminded us of one of the oldest and most powerful technologies to build these connections. Storytelling. In a funny way, this led us back to some of our original ideas. Haircuts. Why haircuts? Besides the aforementioned need for hygiene and personal care, haircuts have deep ties to trust, connection, and community. Hairdressers are known to often play the role of interpersonal helpers. The stories they hear about are diverse. They are often good at social support, listening, and identifying troubles. More importantly, clients can be themselves because they're not coming from an expert angle like a therapist. Perhaps it's because a haircut is something intimate. Letting someone cut your hair is, innately, to trust them. Hence, it's obvious that the space for a haircut is rooted in community. Barbershops and salons are well known as places of conversation and venting feelings. They offer a neutral space for connection and building community. Finally, a good haircut experience gives agency to the client. The client makes decisions about how they want their hair to be cut, and they leave with a new image of themselves with renewed confidence and self-esteem. We want these haircuts to be mobile, to provide access to more homeless communities. It also enables us to tap into different communities of barbers in different neighborhoods who might be willing to volunteer their time. Hence, we will be using a mobile van to transport our equipment. The van will be equipped with a water heater, water tank, basin and hose, haircut equipment, and open windows. Weather permitting, we intend to set up an open, welcoming space outside the van for people to wait in line, but also to start conversations. We hope to create a visible and inviting environment that can draw other individuals to the free haircuts. When patrons are done with their haircut, they will be directed to a social worker stationed outside to connect them with the resources they need. The haircut is a first step to build the initial trust to have that conversation with the social worker. We will provide them with many hygiene kits, which include toothbrushes, toothpaste, sponges, wet wipes, and a card with some resources. So where do we start? We will communicate with various shelters and hope to provide haircuts to people in the shelters to start and then expand to people who are in the streets as well to help them feel empowered. The idea of mobile vans for hygiene has been very successful. For example, Love and May has delivered over 52,000 showers to over 15,000 guests throughout California. And two hairdressers, Hannah and Reed, in Brisbane, Australia, succeed to provide 1,000 free haircuts for the homeless through a mobile barbershop. Inspired by their success, we want to adopt a similar approach to extend our outreach to homeless individuals in Toronto as well. We try to have a safe and welcoming environment where we can engage with them through the provision of free haircuts. Additionally, we have social workers on hand to provide additional support and facilitate connections. To ensure the feasibility of our plan, we have reached out to some barbers we know. Although not all of them are willing to provide services for free, some have expressed interest in volunteering during the free time. This opportunity can also be beneficial for starting barbers, as they can network with others and promote their services. In the future, once our team becomes well-versed in the entire process, we plan to provide training for barbers on how to communicate effectively with homeless individuals as an additional incentive. This could include trauma-informed care training as a foundational skill before initiating conversations. We also see the potential to offer mental health consultations and haircuts as a combined service package for people. If we successfully reach out to unsheltered homeless populations in the city and have a larger volunteer bubble community, we could also consider expanding our service from urban to rural areas. Trust can't be built in one day, but we hope to foster it one haircut at a time. It starts with hair. Thank you. Wow, that was uh, that was really interesting. Thanks. Um, we're going to open it up now for the to the judges for some questions. Judges, hi there. Thanks for the presentation. I'm really curious. What are how are you going to measure success uh, on this? How would you know whether you're ready to scale the solution or not? So, what's the sort of what is the how how do you understand if this is working or not? All right, so um, I think for the start in the starting point, we would want to know, like, we would measure success in the sense that we we're going to pair up with some shelters. Just so we want to see are people actually coming? 
are they receptive to the haircuts? Are they having conversations? Are they enjoying their time with the barber? That's, I think, the starting point of our success metric, so to speak. And then as we expand and we scale up, I think we would want to know as we go, how many people are coming in and are they coming back as well um, whenever they need a haircut again, um, whenever we're in that area. So I think those are some of the things we want to look at in terms of um, success. Uh, to add on to what Karishma said, I think something that's really important is especially the ending part where we wish to connect um, the people who come for haircuts through the social worker to like the various resources and communities and shelters. So definitely, I think we can work with those people who we're partnering with to kind of see like the statistics so we can get uh, the data from their end and then we can feed that back into our system. Great, thank you. I have a question. Um, did you give any thought or uh, uncover anything in your research about the unique needs of particular uh, cultures uh, and their, um, their approaches to uh, hair cutting and hair care? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, we're actually really aware that um, for different cultures, hair is something that's um, really important uh, in terms of like um, different hair textures, different kind of hairstyles. And um, so it's something that we really hope to try and address. And what we hope to do with that is to work with barbers who are of like different like cultures, people who are working in the area. So they kind of know how to deal with like the different kinds of hair and the kind of different expectations that people have with like a hairdressing experience. Uh, but definitely, I guess, logistically, um, this could be one of the difficulties because we can't always be able to get like a diverse group of barbers who are experienced with um, all sorts of different like hairstyles. So that is unfortunately kind of a logistical barrier. Thanks, thanks for that. Other questions from uh, other judges? We have some time. My only question is, uh, did you figure out ways that you might be able to add hair to someone's head? Because if you did, <laughs> I would probably come and find you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. We'll have to consult experts on that. Okay. Any others? Debbie, did you have a question? Okay. Then, no, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say I don't have a question this time. Okay, thanks. Then I want to thank It Starts With Hair, and that was really interesting. And uh, as I said before, now you get a moment to rest and, uh, and recover from your, your pitch. Thank you very much. Our next um, group uh, this evening is um, Ocasio, or I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. It might be Ocasio, but we'll hear about that in just a minute. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah. And I'm Adam. And we're Team Ocasio, hailing from the University of Toronto. Today we are presenting the Branch Out initiative to you. We will go over first our initial research and focus, then primary research that led us to a solution, and finally we will be covering the first steps we are taking to bring in the solution to life. To start, we were first provided with the following challenge statement. How might we turn care and compassion into tangible solutions for people experiencing homelessness? During our initial research, we were inspired to tackle youth, homeless, youth experiencing homelessness from the standpoint of early intervention as it helps young people avert or exit homelessness as quickly as possible, which is essential in avoiding lifelong consequences, including chronic adult homelessness. More specifically, the focus of our solution is on structural prevention by promoting social inclusion and community engagement for youth. Some of the issues youth experiencing homelessness faced are 
building social capital, staying connected to their community, accessing information on youth services from multiple sources, and changing their daily routine and exiting youth culture. Moving forward, we reached out to industry experts around youth. We first reached out to 360 Kids, an organization that provides programs for youth experiencing homelessness. We were directed to Susan Lamb and Bonnie Harkness, who introduced us to the youth strategy. The youth strategy consists of many partners across the York region that, that have come together to develop a system of care, leveraging the skills and expertise of these partners to create a region-wide strategy. The mission is to achieve a cohesive, collaborative network of partners that implement tangible solutions, reducing and preventing the occurrence of youth homelessness. We then reached out to our local public library to get a better understanding on their public services. We learned from Leah Fior that the Richmond Hill Public Library designs youth programs for all youth, no matter their living situation. A challenge that they face is creating programs that better supports the needs of vulnerable youth. Rather than connecting with an outside expert on these services, the library attempts to become the expert themselves, resulting in unnecessary competition. Reflecting on our interviews with Susan and Leah, we analyzed the, in we analyzed the insights, brainstormed ideas, and created a three-phase solution called the Branch Out Initiative. For the first phase, the Richmond Hill Public Library partners with the Youth Strategy and 360 Kids to localize programs for youth experiencing homelessness. This partnership, in this partnership, the library will host programs from the Youth Strategy and 360 Kids and leverage their own network of, of experts to support these programs. On the other side, the Youth Strategy and 360 Kids will be the bridge for youth to successfully engage in programs within their own community. They will also provide informing data from their programs, allowing the library to refine community offerings. Both parties benefit from the partnership and most of all, the youth engage in programs within their own community. So what happens after this partnership? How might we expand the solution to other public libraries and youth services within Toronto? In the second phase, connecting the Ontario Library Association youth services across Ontario and the youth strategy, we can expand the solution province-wide. This expansion has three main benefits, a wider coverage in reaching youth, providing consistent services that they can lean on, and flexibility to travel. With coverage across the province, this equates to an overwhelming amount of youth services. In phase three, to simplify the process, we will create one centralized platform called Branch Out youth will be able to easily find a program and library that best suits their needs. Reflecting on the three phases of the Branch Out initiative, how can we bring this idea to life? We pitched phase one to Lee and Susan and are excited to announce that we are currently facilitating the formation of this partnership for 2023. To summarize our project, the Branch Out initiative harmonizes public libraries and youth services province-wide in a three-phase tangible solution yielding meaningful impacts for youth experiencing homelessness. Thank you for this amazing opportunity and we look forward to hearing your feedback. Cheers. Cheers, uh, Ocasio. Ocasio. Uh, so judges, we have some time now for some questions. If you want to jump on in there. I'll jump in if if that's okay, Abby. Um, I'm just curious, what is the experience that you imagine for youth in this? I mean, I understand the concept of harmonizing all of the programs, which is a, a fantastic idea, but so much of this is about the person experiencing that. And um, I didn't get a good sense of that. So maybe you could just give me a bit of an idea of how you think this would change that experience that they're having today. I think when I'll, I'll uh, answer this one, Sarah, but I think something that was spoken about in chats with the uh, organizations was being in the system and by bringing these programs into the library, it brings it into the community 
And so the youth experiencing homelessness aren't associating themselves with being in, say, in the system. Rather, they're associating themselves with being in the community. And that's a, uh, a mental switch, if you will. I, I have a question as well. Oh, um, Pam, Pamela, did you want to follow up on that? Or I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm good. Thanks, Debbie. Uh, yeah, so um, did in in this design solution, was there any discussion or planning around um, the programming at the library being open, not just to youth experiencing homelessness, but to um, just, or, you know, youth in the community uh, who weren't experiencing homelessness as a way of sort of normalizing the space and making it feel like it was more of a um, uh, of a normal kind of a place to be and hang out rather than something special just for homeless children, right, kids? Um, I guess I'll carry on. Uh, that's kind of exactly why it's, uh, um, I guess, so beautiful in a way. Um, the way that Richmond Hill Public Library said that the goal is for all youth and by bringing in these specific programs um, for youth experiencing homelessness and tying them all together or tying some programs together, that these programs can then um, expand to just all youth in general. And so this is an, another opportunity for, say, youth experiencing homelessness and just youth in general to network as well. I also have a question. <laughs> um, being that we have a lot of youth aging out of care, would these programs be opened up to foster families so that they're aware of it? Because we know that there is youth that, with no skills that age out of care and do get end up homeless. So will that tie in to making sure that across Canada or across Toronto, wherever the programs are, are going to expand into the foster care system so that foster parents can inform the youth that they have about it. It was a bit uh, choppy for me. Is it, are you able to uh, repeat the question? The question is, is this, would the information around the program, if the program is developed, reach out into social services to share with foster care homes who have youth in their in their care because we know that there are a lot of youth who are aging out of care at 18 and they have no life skills and a lot of those youth end up homeless so could, would there be a way to implement the program into the foster care system too absolutely Sorry, it's a big oh, question yeah no worries it's a very long but I'm trying to uh, digest it um it is possible and within this partnership as well, the library actually wants to extend outwards to uh, the program. So it's kind of, we host some programs here, we can uh, give back as well. And uh, to speak on life skills, a uh, program that we're trying to incorporate in the library right now is, uh, it's called the Youth Empowerment Program and it teaches life skills like you're saying. Thanks, This is that's all we have time oh. In terms of q and I'm sorry, um, but uh, that's a really interesting, a wonderful pitch, good, uh, uh, interesting responses. So um, I'm going to ask you to, uh, to step aside now and we'll um, have our next, um, our, our next uh, presenter, which will be, sorry, Enough Seen is up next. Hi everyone, we're Team Smarticle Particles and we're here to present our solution for the Design for Change Challenge of 2023, Enough Seen. My name is Annie, I'm here with Siraj, and we also have our team members Kanish and Nicholas. Um, so the challenge that we decided to focus on was the identification crisis that's currently facing individuals experiencing homelessness in Canada. And so through our research, we found that a lot of barriers to resources had to do with individuals not having identification. And so uh, most food banks, shelters, and of course, health centers will actually require some sort of ID to access their services. Um, and so you might be thinking, uh, maybe individuals can just apply for a new ID. However, then we get into a catch-22 situation where most 
this ID applications actually require another ID. Um, in this event, we have a lot of individuals who are falling through the cracks. Um, as well, even if an individual has ID, environments like encampments, shelters, and street life can all be very dangerous, and incidents of ID being lost and stolen are actually quite common. And so when we look at the current resources that we have available, although we do have ID clinics, ID processing in Canada can take upwards of months, which means that these individuals are still left without access to many crucial resources within that time. And so uh, before we actually talk about our solution, I wanted to take us through a little bit about our design thinking process. Um, and so we started with uh, empathize, which meant connecting with individuals who are experiencing homelessness to understand some of the most impactful challenges they face. And so this included connecting with uh, researchers, um, doctors, people who work with uh, individuals with lived experience, and also some of the mentors that were provided to us through the Design for Change Challenge. Um, then we moved on to defining our problem statement, outlining and action, population, and outcome to arrive at our question, how might we minimize the consequences of not possessing identification for Canada's unhoused population to decrease barriers to accessible resources? Um, finally, we did our ideation phase by using primary and secondary research to inform possible solutions and ideas. Having given more time and resources, we might have gone on to our prototyping phase in which we could create testable solutions um, in order to further our uh, enough seen idea. So to tackle the ID crisis, Enough Seen has designed an NFC wristband to serve as a temporary piece of identification to enable access to social and healthcare services for Canada's unhoused population. This wristband is subtly designed and contains only the user's unique identification number, so no location is tracked. So first, individuals will apply for identification at a partnered ID clinic and are given an NFC-enabled wristband to serve as an interim piece of ID. Next, at partnered community centers and shelters will distribute a kiosk that wristbands can be scanned against to display nearby services and updates on ID applications. Then acting as a temporary piece of ID, users can gain access to essential services like booking shelter beds or getting food stamps instead of having to wait months for their permanent ID to get processed and delivered. As users continuously use their wristband, workers behind the kiosk will provide updates on the status of their ID applications. And the life cycle of the wristband repeats when a user's ID application is complete and they return the wristband to the respective ID clinic in exchange for a permanent ID to continue accessing those services. Now, these next steps will make sure that enough scene becomes a reality. First of all, acknowledging that design thinking is an iterative process will continue including diverse voices from our community in the prototyping and testing of our solution. Furthermore, it's really important that Enough Scene creates sustainable and practical wristbands for the unhoused population. Sourcing environmentally conscious, comfortable, durable materials is going to be really vital towards enabling a positive and easy to use user experience. Finally, we'll initiate strategic partnerships with trusted community, organizational, and political leaders to align ourselves with in fighting Canada's ID crisis. It's imperative that we launch enough scene through trusted community partners to get sufficient uptake from the unhoused population and build trust in our solution in the community. So gaining social traction, funding, and policy are all crucial components of bringing our solution to life. Now, the ID crisis in Ontario has left countless homeless folks living in systemic invisibility. We've seen enough of this. Have you? Interesting. Thanks. Um, I'm sure the judges have some questions for you. Who would like to kick us off? Wally. Yeah, well, you you talked about it right at the end. I think I think it's a very unique and, and, and interesting concept and idea. But at the, at the end, you talked about sourcing. So my question is, is who does create and pay for these wristbands? Hi. Yeah, sorry, I can get us started and then my teammates feel free to join in um, when you feel like it. But I think that um, the sourcing for this would come from shelters and from um, government funds. Um, I think that it, it's hard to ask for people to pay for the response themselves, given the situations that they find themselves in. So um, we would, I guess, rely on government funding for these. But uh, NFC response are among the cheapest forms of response available. 
Um, and as a result, it would be a cost effective solution as compared to other solutions like Apple Watches and things of like that nature. And, and just as a quick follow up to that, um, oftentimes for for individuals experiencing homelessness and and other marginalized situations there is concern around privacy and uh you know what's happening to their information what would go into ensuring that these folks um are not being further um uh, traumatized or or further victimized by the 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 use of their private information yeah, for sure. That's an excellent question. That's something that we thought about a lot in our designing process. So there are actually a few things. Um, the first is making it very clear that there is no location being tracked with the NFC bracelet. Um, this is only a, a means for um, people to scan against services, and, and there is no connection to the internet or location tracking services with these bracelets. So um, that fear is uh, assuaged within the structure of the bracelet itself. Um, I think also, it's very crucial for us to work through trusted partner um, services in putting this bracelet together, because um, that way, um, you know, there's a familiar face rather than um, an unfriendly face in uh, distributing these bracelets. And I think a key component is uh, translating, um, you know, this information to individuals experiencing homelessness in, in a way that they understand. Um, so uh, we would hope to, you know, show them how it works maybe bringing in um, people knowledgeable about this to speak with them about how it actually works so that um, there's a trust being established as a result. Thank you. I, I have a question, um, and perhaps I just missed this, but what is the value of doing this in a digital you know, wristband format over a printed laminated on a lanyard kind of form of ID? Oh, uh, you're muted, Nicholas. Oh, so sorry about that. There we go. Um, I can get us started on that. And I think really the idea behind using a more digital solution is that it enables all of our all of our kiosks to be to be essentially connected to one another. So, for example, an individual who an individual experiencing homelessness who receives their bracelet after processing their after applying for ID can still access information on their ID. On, on their ID application, whether they're at a shelter or at a different at a different community partner. As well with that, for example, that idea of being able to access this information from anywhere allows them to, to do things that we've outlined in our presentation, such as, for example, the booking of, of shelter beds, potentially healthcare appointments, or any other sort of essential services. Okay, thanks. Uh, I've got a, a message here from Priya that we're at the three minute mark, so we are going to have to thank you and uh, move to our next and final team uh, for this evening. That would be um, 40 Chances. Uh, so good luck, 40 Chances. Hi, my name is Jackie and I'm looking in the behind my house in the ravine and I see a person uh, living in a tent, it looks like. And I'm really scared about, you know, needles and disease and stuff. And I'm worried about my kids and I'm worried about my dog. Like, I, I want him moved. I want somebody to deal with this. 911, what service do you need? Police, ambulance or fire? What is the emergency? And explain what is happening right now, please. Yeah, I can see a tent and there's a bunch of stuff piled all around the tent. And I've seen him come in and out of the tent and he looks all, you know, disheveled and he, you know, I'm kind of scared of him. And I'm, I don't know what he's doing in there and I don't know if he's doing drugs or what's going on. It doesn't sound like you are in immediate danger, Jackie. Is that correct? Okay, perfect. It doesn't sound like you need an ambulance right now either. Um, you said you can't see the person in the tent whether they need assistance. Uh, I'm going to patch you through to a crisis support worker who supports specifically with the homeless population. They can find the most appropriate resources to help you. Hold on one minute while I make that connection. 911, what service do you need? Police, ambulance, or fire? What is the emergency? And explain what is happening right now, please. 
My name's Mandy. I'm worried about my sister. She was living in the camp in the River Valley, and it's been moved, and I haven't heard from her in two weeks. I'm really worried about her. Her name's Christy. Where is she? Hi, Mandy. Uh, this is 911, and uh, my understanding is you're looking for your sister, Christy. So I just got a couple questions for you. When was the last time that you've seen her? Uh, what kind of condition was she in? Does she normally go missing like this? Um, if you could answer some of these questions for me, I could uh, put you through and uh, get us in touch with our crisis worker to continue this uh, conversation and hopefully help you find your sister. I last saw my sister two weeks ago, just before the encampment was removed. She seemed to be in really good condition, and she normally doesn't go missing like this because she just lives on the street for now. Thank you, Manny, for that uh, information. I was sure to make sure I pass that on. Also, can you just give a, a brief description of what your sister looks like? She's about 5'6", Caucasian, brown hair, shoulder length, brown eyes. Okay, Manny, I'm going to patch you through the crisis support worker who works specifically with the homeless population. They can find the most appropriate resources to help you. Hold on while I make that connection. <laughs> 911, what service do you need? Police, ambulance, or fire? What is the emergency? And explain what is happening right now, please. Hi, I'm calling to report someone on my property. There's a man in the backyard hiding behind the shed. He seems to be struggling to get on his feet, and I don't know if he's, he's hurt or he's drunk, but when I asked him to leave, he got really angry and started yelling at me and waving a stick. So please help me. I'm really scared. Are you safe in your house and the doors are locked? Perfect. I'm going to notify the police, but I'm also going to notify our crisis outreach worker who works specifically with the homeless population. Help is on the way, ma'am. Historically, people experiencing homelessness have been subject to discrimination and racism by law enforcement leading to a lack of trust and fear of the police. Unhoused people share that they are likely to be criminalized or stigmatized, and this led to a reluctance to call 911 for help, particularly in cases of mental health crisis or substance abuse issues. We need radical shifts in attitudes and actions to uproot the racism that continues to plague our society. If there is ignorance, we must educate. If there is denial, we must promote the truth. If there is hate, we must show kindness and compassion. Our collective duty is to fight against the prejudice and discrimination experienced by unhoused people, make them feel part of the community, help them gain trust in service providers, and receive prompt assistance when needed. They deserve to be treated with respect and dignity, and have equal rights as all other Canadian citizens. Thanks, 40 Chances. Um, I, I see some of our judges have already come off camera, so I'll turn it over to them. Hi, folks. Thanks for the presentation. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm struggling a little bit. What is the solution that you're proposing? Maybe you could articulate that um, pretty, you know, for us again. So we, I think you yeah. outlined the discrimination and the issues. What is the proposed solution? Yeah, absolutely. When we looked at the uh, the unhoused population, one of the things that we found was that there was three distinct users that we could that we could look at. The first was the unhoused person um, directly. The second one was the general public, and they are they misunderstand the unhoused, they misunderstand the issues, and so the connection that they have together with the unhoused and the general public is often the police. So they're calling 911 and they're making those phone calls like we demonstrated in our video. So our big idea and our problem is that um, we could expand the existing OPP crisis call diversion program right now that is in place with um, various regions um, that Solgen um, announced a couple of years ago. We could it, um, expand that program 
uh, to include uh, a particular uh, avenue for calls coming into 911 related to the unhoused, that instead of going to police, it could possibly go to um, harm reduction uh, agencies, it could go to outreach workers, it could go um, in cases where there is a public safety issue, um, it could go to police as well. But again, it would be diverted from a purely police response to um, agencies and organizations that might be better suited to help that unhoused person with the needs that they have at that particular moment. Great, fantastic, thanks. Appreciate it. Wally, I see your camera's on. Yeah, so <clears throat> I actually had the same question to start with. Um, and so now, but I was assuming, I was making that assumption that that was the idea is sort of a more of a, of a crisis line approach to uh, like emergency response, which, you know, eliminates, eliminates the unnecessary use of some of the emergency services and, and also ties in a, a, a much more compassionate, I guess, approach to addressing some of these issues without criminalizing people and so forth. My question is, what appetite have you found uh, there to be from like police services or dispatch to actually um, engage or incorporate in something like this? Yeah, so um, Team 40 Chances, many of us have are in the criminology and policing program at Laurier. So um, we did have, uh, we felt like a unique educational background compared to some of the um, other participants. Um, we relied on what we know and we relied on that particular um, education. So we know about the engagements with police, with the, with um, those with mental illness. Um, we've studied, you know, the engagements with police, with um, the unhoused as well. And we also, as part of our submission, we looked at um, very current uh, media articles regarding encampments and engagements with police. One of our user interviews that we did, um, we did 15 user interviews with various people. Um, including a retired police officer. And we got feedback from them regarding, um, from him regarding his experience with the unhoused and responding as a police officer. Things like sitting for hours in the ER with somebody who was in crisis that didn't want to be there, um, transporting people um, upon the request of, of uh, the general public to move them to uh, like a shelter and they didn't want to be there. That was against their wishes. Um, and we also heard from the parent of an out unhoused person who really just wanted the opportunity to call somebody and, you know, find uh, find her child. And um, when we looked at uh, some of the metrics and call volumes with the police, there was a reason why Soljin decided to divert um, crisis calls um, in their program that they announced a couple of years ago. And we felt that there was an opportunity to use that same, the same metrics, like how many calls are coming in, how many calls could be diverted to the to more appropriate agencies uh, for the unhoused and for the general public. Jackie, um, I'm going to have to stop you there. I'm sorry. We've gone way past our three minute mark. I'm really sorry. I, I know these are important discussions, but unfortunately, we're we're out of time. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, this team and to all the teams, um, all of you, um, please now uh, take take a minute while um, uh, while the judges uh, are going to uh, go off and deliberate to finalize the top three teams. But really, congratulations, big thank you to all of the participants. Um, I'm really amazed at what you were accomplished, able to accomplish in a, the span of a few weeks. And I know that these five minute videos doesn't begin to do justice to the, um, the enormous uh, amounts of research and to the, the reports that you submitted. Um, but anyway, thanks very much and congratulations to everybody. Uh, we're gonna take uh, about 15 minutes or so now to, uh, to talk uh, amongst ourselves with the judges. Hello, everyone. Uh, a bit of housekeeping as the judges head into the deliberation room. Uh, you'll have about 15 minutes now, as Abby mentioned, uh, for an intermission, a bit of a break. 
Uh, we always we also ask and encourage you to vote in the audience choice prize uh, vote. So that will be using the QR code on the left of your screen here. Um, that will be closing with five minutes remaining. Uh, so be sure to do that first. Uh, you'll have the option of the five teams you saw this evening. Uh, in addition, if you are a participant and you've not completed the feedback survey yet, we also ask that you uh, do so if you'd like. Uh, you can use the survey on the right hand uh, side here of your screen. Uh, and with that, if you do have any questions as well, please feel free to post them in Slack and we'll be happy to help. We'll see you in 15 minutes.
we'll just need, <clears throat> excuse me, just a few more minutes for the judges to complete the deliberation. Uh, we'll be wrapping up shortly.
I think we're back. Are we all back? We're all back. Okay, then. All right. Well, thank you. I want to uh, say thank you to all of the teams, all, all of you who came up with such incredible solutions. It was, uh, it was difficult. We were, we were in there right up until the very last minute. Um, but uh, really, all of the solutions were incredible. And uh, the hard work that you put in for this challenge is absolutely tangible. I also want to thank um, our judges. <laughs> this was a very challenging task of uh, choosing um, our Design for Change winners uh, tonight. So without further ado, I know you're dying to know. So Pamela uh, is now going to announce the winners of the Design for Change Challenge. Thank you, Abby, so much. Hi, folks. My name is Pamela Hillborn. My pronouns are she and her. And today I have glasses on and I have long brown hair and I'm wearing a brown sweater. And I'm thrilled to have been given the, frankly, the honor of announcing uh, the, the winners. So uh, we can get started. I think we can go to the first slide, which is, uh, I believe, the audience choice. All right, so again, um, and just before I announce the, win the winner of the audience choice, just a reminder that uh, the winners of the team will receive $100 per person as the audience choice award. And again, before I announce that award, just to add to a little bit of the suspense, thank you so much to all of the teams and all of the fantastic ideas that we saw today. It was really heart hearting, heartening and inspiring, frankly, to see how folks are coming together to solve such an incredible issue for uh, people in Canada. All right, audience choice. Let's go to the winner, shall we? Uh, the Branch Out Initiative uh, by Team Ocasio. So congratulations to Team Ocasio, the Branch Out Initiative, which as a reminder was focused on helping uh, youths and pulling together youth programming to lessen the stigma of being in the system and bringing it more into the community. So fantastic job, uh, Team Ocasio, congratulations. All right, I think we're gonna go now to third place. Reminder for the folks on the line, third place winners, uh, it's a $1,000 Canadian per team member is the prize here. Uh, and without further ado, let's go, to, let's go to the third place winner slide. All right, uh, congratulations to team 40 chances. Um, you know, 40 chances, I had to ask you guys a question when uh, you folks a question when you were on the line around what the solution was. Um, having had it explained it, it, it really resonated uh, with the, the judges. And, um, you know, just the idea of potentially changing how uh, folks respond to calls in 911 uh, is why you guys landed here in this place. So congratulations to 40 chances. All right, and then second place, it's getting, it's getting even tighter here. This is $2,000 per team member for the winners of the second place, the teams in second place. And now we're gonna go to that, the second place winner slide. Oh, there they are again. Okay, this is audience favorite. And also second place winners, Team Ocasio, congratulations for the Branch Out Initiative. Again, um, I already went through that one because you guys are the audience select, but uh, the, the what really resonated with the judges was uh, bringing together, focusing frankly on youth homelessness and, and starting there in addition to the idea of being part of the community and, um, and, and bringing that into communities. Now, obviously all of the solutions that were presented are gonna have to work through problems in front of them, but fantastic job Team Ocasio and, and, uh, and congratulations on your second place. All right, and now for uh, first place, reminder here, first place, $3,000 Canadian per team member for the first place team. And we can go there and announce this year's winner. Huge congratulations to Heels on Wheels, the Game Changers. Uh, fantastic job here. Uh, what really resonated in the judges room for this initiative was just how impactful the solution could be for women who are experiencing homelessness by providing um, care specifically for women's health. Uh, and also the idea that you had a, a place where you were gonna start and you were gonna be able to scale it out. So congratulations to Game Changers team on your first place win. 
Um, and really just wrapping it up, it's such a thrill to be part of this uh, challenge and to hear all of the fantastic ideas. And it is really one of the toughest things to actually try and figure out um, which of the teams are gonna end up first, second, third place. Uh, and everybody today who presented did a fantastic job. So thank you all very much um, and great ideas today to help us solve really what we consider to be one of the more intractable issues of humanity, right? Which is providing care and service for every single human. And Abby, I think I'll turn it over to you. Okay then, woo! That was uh, that was a lot, uh, and uh, uh, to uh, to our uh, our uh, award winners tonight, we will be contacting you through the Slack channel with the next steps for uh, getting your awards. Uh, everyone, I want to thank you. Uh, you gave your time and expertise to make this design challenge flourish. Um, so thank you to everyone who was involved in this over, uh, well, nearly 400 participants, uh, 14 speakers, 20 mentors, 24 judges, 50 community partners, all of you have worked so hard to make this challenge what it is. And uh, we really hope to see you at our next challenge. Uh, last but not no, by no means least, I want to thank Pamela Hilborn and our sponsor, Scotiabank. We truly appreciate your support. I'm sure our participants do as well. So we really enjoyed having you all be a part of the challenge. Before we sign off, just know that this does not have to be goodbye. We would like you to keep in touch with us on social media. Um, we, I want to keep in touch with all of you. Uh, it, just because you might not have made it to the finals or you might not have made it to the top three, does not mean that you did not have a great solution and I for one would like to keep working with you on those so reach out to me if that's something that you want to do too. Um, also if you haven't already uh, please complete our feedback surveys we want to make sure that every design for challenge is better than the last and this is the only way we can improve our programming so uh, we'll post that on the slack channel thanks so much for joining us for the finale uh, tonight and I hope to see you all at the next challenge Bye.